How important is your relationship with Washington and how has it either changed or improved since President Obama took office? Well, it's a relationship with strong historic ties. Um, the United States was the first country to recognize our independence back in the 19th century. But today it is experiencing a new chapter, a new chapter that I think didn't start yesterday. It was built uh, through the presidency of President Lula to begin with. And now, uh, with the visit of President Dilma to Washington, prior to that, President Obama to Brasilia, what we're trying to do is create a partnership for the 21st century. What do we mean by that? Um, we'd like to place increasing emphasis on science, technology, innovation. The United States is a formidable partner for Brazil in, in all these areas. Uh, it has extraordinary creativity, some of the best universities in the world. We're trying to send more Brazilian students to study abroad uh, through a program called Science Without Borders. And the United States is an obvious destination for these students. Uh, the reason why President Dilma was at MIT and Harvard when she came to the US. And we signed some agreements with these um, world-renowned uh, establishments. This in addition to the fact that the United States is one of our major trading partners. Uh, investment by Brazilian companies in the US is increasing. Um, uh, we have a number of uh, mechanisms for coordination uh, on a number of areas and we're constantly updating these mechanisms now. We've created a group on innovation that will bring together government, private sector, academic world. We have a new group on investment. We have uh, private sector groups like the CEO Forum that support some of uh, the new initiatives like the Science Without Borders. So very dynamic, very robust relationship. Um, I was very pleased to host uh, Secretary uh, of State Hillary Clinton in Brazil recently. She came for yet another initiative that Brazil and the U.S. are leading, which is the Open Government Partnership on best practices, uh, transparency, um, accountability by governments. Um, and uh, in that context, we also met bilaterally to discuss political issues. I think political dialogue is also uh, a very important part of our agenda. Regarding the Open Government Partnership, talk just a little bit more about that. What are its objectives? Well, it's a, um, a group of countries uh, that uh, come together uh, voluntarily uh, to uh, assume um, goals and, and targets and plans that they present themselves. Uh, this in no way should create um, a listing or a ranking of countries according to their uh, openness or transparency. It's, uh, it should be seen um, as uh, a venue for exchanging best practices for countries to um, incentive, uh, create incentives for improvement in, in governance. Um, and in this spirit, a, uh, an increasing number of countries are joining. Uh, Does it extend beyond the Western Hemisphere? Oh, absolutely. Okay? It's a worldwide initiative. Brazil and the U.S. launched it last year. Um, through President Obama and President Dilma Rousseff on the margins of the United Nations General Assembly. And since then, uh, the interest uh, it has generated is, is quite impressive. And uh, we're very proud to be part of this uh, exercise. And it has stimulated quite a bit of uh, discussion. Uh, and some countries that yet don't feel uh, comfortable participating, but they still come to the meetings and share in the discussions and try to learn from the practices of other countries. Mr. Minister, I want to turn your attention now to Brazil-Africa relations. Many countries in Africa look to Brazil as an economic and political model. How important is Africa to, Brazil, to Brazil's foreign and uh, economic policy? Well, Africa is um, a neighboring continent, uh, so we increasingly look towards Africa as uh, part of our uh, near abroad or near uh, geography. Um, Brazil's identity could not be what it is without the contribution of um, Africa. Um, more than half uh, Brazilian citizens identify themselves as having some uh, African ascendance. And today Africa is a land of opportunity, of change, of economic growth. Um, there are still tremendous challenges. Uh, I don't want to underestimate the challenges. But we also see movement in a very progressive direction. And we are engaging increasingly with Africa through the establishment of new embassies. Um, today, uh, we have more embassies in Africa than the United Kingdom, for example. Um, 
on the Atlantic coast. There's only one country where we don't have uh, an embassy at this point, and, and we will probably be, be correcting that um, gap very soon. Um, which, the, is, which country? It's the Gambia. It's okay. a small country with which we have very friendly relations. Um, but embassies are not an end in, in themselves. Uh, they are an outpost. Uh, they are a, uh, um, an illustration of our desire to engage politically, to participate in the economic development, um, to be present uh, in uh, whatever way we can, to um, help in their agricultural and rural development and their um, administrative policies, uh, food security, energy security. In some countries, we're sharing experience with uh, biofuels and ethanol, and this would alleviate their energy bill. Um, and in addition to that, there's an increasing number of uh, Brazilian companies. The private sector is moving into Africa also very swiftly. So large companies are already very active in places like Angola, Mozambique, but also moving into other areas in West Africa, like Guinea-Conakry. Um, I was recently in Mauritania, a country where uh, no Brazilian foreign minister had set foot uh, before and I identified many opportunities. So you can be sure that we will be um, increasingly engaged with Africa in a true spirit of partnership um, where I believe um, we have something to contribute, uh, but we have a lot to learn also. Mr. Minister, I wanted to uh, turn to the so-called BRIC nations, of course, of which you are a part. Um, of course, BRIC stands for uh, the, um, you know, the, it's an acronym, of course, coming to symbolize the shift in global power away from the developed uh, G7 countries. Uh, it involves Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Right now, it seems more like an economic uh, grouping, but does it have the uh, objective, do you have the intention of moving beyond economics and, f and functioning more as a political bloc? You're right to point out that it uh, started out as an economic grouping and the most intense coordination takes place, for example, in discussions related to the uh, quota regime at the IMF and the World Bank and uh, G20 issues. Um, however, uh, as uh, the BRICS meet more frequently at summit level and a number of um, subgroups are created, um, the political agenda is, is coming into to play uh, there was another uh, circumstance that um, contributed to this, the fact that they were all in the Security Council last year. Uh, of course, Russia and China are permanent members, but Brazil, India, and South Africa uh, were non-permanent during 2011, and this created a favorable context for closer coordination. It doesn't mean that positions are identical, it doesn't mean that we vote necessarily in the same way, but I think um, the consensus among the BRICS is that uh, um, there's benefit to be derived from uh, closer coordination, closer exchange of views um, on issues. I would also point out to another group uh, Brazil participates in, which is the IBSA group, India, Brazil, South Africa. It's smaller and it has a transformational agenda uh, that perhaps the BRICS doesn't have in terms of promoting um, reform of the Security Council, more democratic governance, um, and uh, it has also been acting together in promoting small-scale but uh, nevertheless significant projects helping least developed countries. There are projects in Haiti, um, in the uh, Palestinian occupied territories in Sri Lanka and elsewhere. I think it's a demonstration of these three countries' desire to assume greater responsibility um, in favor of peace and development worldwide and in strengthening the multilateral system. That's a very interesting point because um, I would imagine that at some point Brazil uh, could perhaps have a, some conflict with a couple of the countries in BRIC, perhaps China and Russia vis-a-vis -vis their record on, on human rights and other positions that perhaps Brazil would be less comfortable in, in trying to reconcile its positions on. Well, conflict would not be a, a word that I would use in this context. Um, there are differences that are uh, determined by historic evolution. Um, and as I um, was saying yesterday at the American Jewish Committee, uh, when it comes to human rights, um, our uh, starting point, our assumption is that um, everywhere in the world, or in, in every country, uh, there's progress to be made. 
um, whether you're highly developed, where you're uh, still a uh, rural or at least developed country. Um, and I, you know, I mentioned Guantanamo in the United States. You know, there are xenophobic tendencies in Europe. You know, we have our own challenges in our prison system in Brazil. Others will have different challenges. The important thing is uh, for us to do this in a multilateral environment, uh, free from uh, selective uh, finger pointing, and in a way that will enhance cooperation and will actually have an impact for the people who are suffering uh, human rights violations or threats of human rights violations. Mr. Minister, we've been talking a lot about the points of convergence between the United States and Brazil, mm -hmm. but there are probably some sticking points, some, some issues on which you disagree. What are those areas? You know, um, what, what I find important to stress is the level of maturity in the relationship. When you have mature relationships, um, you can highlight the affinity uh, that brings you together, and you can also have are areas of disagreement. Um, offhand, um, I can mention one uh, that was um, very much a topic at the recent summit of, of the Americas, uh, where President Obama attended and many of the uh, America's leaders were there. And as you know and have probably followed, a uh, topic for discussion was participation by Cuba. Uh, now, uh, there is a consensus among Latin American and Caribbean countries that Cuba should be uh, invited and should participate. Cuba indeed uh, will assume the chairmanship of a new, new grouping called the uh, Latin American Caribbean Community, CELAC, that was created last year in Caracas. Um, it is fu fully engaged with all the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. All countries in this region have diplomatic relations with Cuba. The leadership in Cuba is undertaking um, impressive uh, reforms, updating of their economic model. They're, showing a um, openness to new ideas and I think this should be encouraged and the best way to encourage is to incorporate Cuba into uh, the fora that we create for ourselves. I want to turn back to the Middle East very briefly uh, and back to for example Iran. Iran has been extending its influence in Latin America of late. Do you see this as a, a positive or potentially a negative uh, phenomenon? Well, countries are free to extend beyond their region uh, as they see fit. Uh, and um, this is uh, not necessarily positive or negative, I think, uh, to the extent that it brings prosperity and added opportunity for the peoples involved, uh, I think uh, it's desirable. So uh, we have no difficulty uh, with Iran having a stronger presence in our part of the world. Iran. It's an old civilization with a vibrant society. Um, recently, a very interesting Iranian movie won an Oscar here in the United States for Best Foreign Language Film, and it demonstrated the u universal appeal of their cinematographic uh, industry. So, um, no, we see this as a, a natural development, and I might add that uh, even though uh, there are concerns regarding the peaceful nature of Iran's nuclear program, that are being dealt with at the IAEA and the Security Council. There's no ban on trade or on diplomatic relations with Iran, so this is something that we view as natural. On the other hand, Iran is a, one could characterize it as a bad actor. It does su uh, support terrorist organizations. It's uh, uh, fomenting, you know, extremism. That doesn't uh, affect uh, your region? Well, uh, we don't want anybody uh, fomenting or supporting terrorism in our region. Um, South America is a uh, comparatively very peaceful part of the world. In fact, if you look at the developing world, it, you won't find another region that is fully democratic with economic growth, with uh, uh, reduction of poverty, absence of weapons of mass destruction, and uh, in fact, one of the lowest military budgets in the world. So um, in that case, I'll, I'll have to be very firm in answering if anyone is intending to export terrorism or um, introduce uh, more military tension in our part of the world, uh, we will be against that. With regard to Iran's nuclear program, as, as you know, um, there's a new approach. Uh, we note that Brazil and in Turkey had a proposal to uh, try to uh, um, stop Iran from enriching uranium to weapons level grades, etc. 
that didn't go through. Uh, now there's a more, um, let's say, uh, an approach with strict sanctions and also dip diplomacy. Um, does Brazil support this current approach by the so-called P5 plus one uh, on uh, imposing harsh sanctions and trying, you know, to resolve this diplomatically. What's Brazil's position on this current approach? Well, Brazil has always been in favor of uh, a uh, diplomatic approach to the, um, let's call it the Iranian challenge, uh, which is something that we have discussed at the IAEA and the Security Council. Um, so, uh, to the extent that uh, current efforts uh, privilege uh, diplomacy, negotiation, dialogue, uh, we are supportive, of course. Uh, we have also been um, very firm, and my president has conveyed this on different occasions, including to the uh, U.S. president, that we believe that uh, military intervention in Iran would be disastrous. It would actually uh, destabilize a region that is already known for its very high levels of instability uh, with very unpredictable consequences, in fact, um, without achieving at all uh, the objectives that those who defend these ideas uh, would be intending to achieve. So um, when Brazil and Turkey joined uh, in 2010 to try and, uh, to find a way forward and promote a confidence building measure, it was very much in the spirit of ideas that had been discussed um, among the P5 plus one. Um, uh, to some extent, I think we missed an opportunity because we could be at a, a later stage and the creation of confidence between Iran and the West. There's a great um, gap in confidence um, and uh, difficulty in communication that needs to be uh, bridged uh, so that you know, the region can benefit for, from more stable conditions. Uh, the last thing the Middle East needs is a new focus of uh, military attrition.